We're so grateful to have you join us for worship today. Our call to worship is found in the description beneath the video. Please join with us. Beloved, we are called to love one another because love is from God. God's love is poured in us from our earth. We are called to extend the love of God to all people. God's love is taught to us through the witness of God's faithful people. We are called to proclaim God's love in all that we say and do. In all creation, in all our relationships, may God's love be made known. Amen. Please turn to page 384 in the Methodist hymnal. We're going to sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. of mortals and of angels but do not have love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love I am nothing if I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love I gain nothing love is patient love is kind Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. But we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, 
but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. scribes came near and heard Jesus disputing with the Sadducees and seeing that he answered them well he asked him which commandment is the first of all Jesus answered the first is hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now we're going to sing page 560 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Help us accept each other.
please welcome back Bishop Farr of the Missouri Annual Conference. He is with us today to introduce our guest preacher. Our preacher this morning is the Reverend Hank Jenkins. Hank is a deacon in the United Methodist Church here in Missouri. Much of his career has been focused in youth ministry. However, he is currently the co-chair of the Association of Ministers with Disabilities and working on his doctoral ministry from the Wesleyan Theological Seminary with a focus on helping churches be more hospitable and welcoming to people with disabilities, as well as empowering and encouraging leadership among disabled. Welcome today, Hank Jenkins. Greetings. Now, as I get started, I have something that I need to get off my chest. I have a confession that I need to make, and I hope that it won't tarnish your view of me too much. My confession is, I happen to really love the 1980s power ballad, particularly the love songs. So much so that if I hear one of these songs playing on the radio, I can't help but sing out loud along to it. Now, I know that doesn't win me a lot of cool points and really isn't that unique, and I'm okay with that for the most part. But I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s, and some of my favorite memories are watching movies that are littered with these songs. And who doesn't sing along to Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart or Journey's Don't Stop Believin'? But as I've been preparing for this week's sermon, there is one song in particular that kept popping into my head, a song made famous by the band Foreigner, I Want to Know What Love Is. Now, I'll give you a second to let that earworm set in. Now, knowing I was writing over a portion of scripture, scripture commonly known as the love passage, I couldn't keep that song out of my head. I would go to start reading the commentaries on the scripture, and suddenly in my head I would hear, I want to know what love is. And I would go to write my outline, and instantly I would think, and I know you can show me. Now, I, I'm truly sorry about that singing. I know it's awful, but it had to be done. But I began wondering, why does this song keep popping into my head when working on this sermon? So I decided to do some research about the origins of the hit, and I was surprised to find a couple of things of interest. The first being, the song was written by band member Mick Jones about 3 a.m. one night as he was fighting insomnia. In an article I read, Jones said, I don't know where it came from. I consider it a gift that was sent through me. I think there was something bigger than me that was behind it. I'd say it was probably written entirely by a higher force. As I read that, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. As I continued to read, I learned that in order to enhance, in order to enhance the song in a, quote, spiritual way, the band decided to invite members of the New Jersey Mass Choir to sing backup. And as they were recording with the choir members, Jones said the takes they were getting were good, but they were still a little tentative. So members of the choir took it upon themselves to form a circle, join hands, and they began praying the Lord's Prayer. After that, the band and choir were able to finish the recording in just one take. Jones said the moment was so emotional for him that it left him in tears. And once again, I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I had no idea there was such a spiritual side to this song. But the thing I found most interesting is that Jones believes the song is an expression of a time in his life when he couldn't decide whether his heart was half full or half empty. Though the band was experiencing a huge amount of success and fame at that point, Jones himself was going through a divorce, and members of the band were beginning what he calls a Cold War period of internal strife. You can almost imagine that though they were having all of this success, Jones was feeling alone and isolated as divisions were splintering the relationships around him. And that's when I thought, okay, that is something I can work with. Because much like the song, the scripture from 1 Corinthians 13 is one we just assume is all about romantic love. 
but beneath the surface, it is really about a community being torn apart by division, conflict, and pride. Now, much like the song, I want to know what love is, the scripture from 1 Corinthians 13 is one that most of you have probably heard before. In fact, it is one that even people who don't attend church on a regular basis become familiar with because it is so often used at weddings. Multiple lists on the internet refer to 1 Corinthians 13 as the number one scripture verse used at marriage ceremonies because people are drawn to it, to its beautiful language and description about what love should be. But the truth is the context in which this scripture was written is almost the exact opposite of two people committing themselves to a lifelong relationship. One commentary I read said the situation could almost be described as one nearing divorce rather than entering into marriage. This letter is written to a whole community of people who have differing opinions, differing backgrounds, and in all honesty, just don't get along that much. Some of you may already know that Paul has written this letter to the Corinthians to respond to infighting that he has been told about within the community. Earlier, earlier in the letter, Paul refers to attempts the community has made to divide themselves out among those who will follow the teachings of Paul and those who will follow the teachings of Apollos, another leader within this community. And they are basing these divisions on who they believe has the right belief or the right practice of Christianity and those who don't. Does that sound familiar? How many times have we divided ourselves out among who we think is right and who we think is wrong? Who we think has right practice and who we think is don't? Almost as if we're rooting for competing sports teams. But for Paul, the point of living together as this community is not to di differentiate yourselves among who might be right or who might be wrong. And to do so would be missing the point altogether. Rather, the community should use their individual gifts talents and ideas to build one another up. And it is important to note that for Paul, few of these gifts are seen as better than the others. The gifts that an individual brings into a community are to be recognized and lifted up and not dismissed as unworthy or useless. And everyone brings a gift to a community. As a United Methodist minister, I have worked hard to try to recognize and understand my own gifts for ministry. And one thing that I am uniquely skilled for is an ability to help teach the church how to reach out to and welcome people with disabilities. As a disabled person myself, I have firsthand experience of living as a part of a community that is often misunderstood and often devalued. People with disabilities are often seen with pity and not offered many opportunities to even be a part of a church community or leadership because of physical or attitudinal barriers. And when they are welcomed into these faith communities, they are often seen as objects to be ministered to rather than partners to be in ministry with. However, many disabled Christians have clung to this idea of the body of Christ that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians because it recognizes that all individuals have an authentic place within a community, no matter how misunderstood or how devalued. And what makes this possible is what Paul refers to at the end of chapter 12 as an even better way, or as it is in, uh, described in the NRSV, uh, as a more excellent way. And he describes that more excellent way in chapter 13 as placing love at the center of everything the community does. The bond of the community and the value of each individual finds its foundation in love above all other things. And this is a love that does not insist on its own understanding and it does not insist on its own way of doing things. However, it is a love that says, I recognize you as a part of God's beloved creation, and we are tied to one another no matter how different we think we, we are. Love is the starting point and the ending point of all of our relationships. And it is important to note that Christ is the example of this love. Christ, whose self-giving and self-sacrificial love led him to the cross, Christ, whose love for everyone led him to eat with sinners and welcome those who were outcasts. And Christ, who said, in order to love God, 
we also had to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Using Christ as an example of how we should measure the love we offer to those around us, Paul tells us what love is, and more importantly, what love is not. First, he tells us what love is not in saying love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, and it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Now, I know many of us have heard these words a million times, but they are so important for us to really understand them. As Christian people, we cannot insist that we love and believe in Christ on one hand, but on the other insist on actions or attitudes that are hurtful and harmful to others around us, especially those who may have differing backgrounds and opinions from ourselves or those who live a life differently than we do. But Paul contrasts this saying with what love is. He writes, love is patient, love is kind, love rejoices in the truth, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. There are a couple things that I think are important about what Paul is saying here. First, it is important that we recognize that this love that he's describing is an active love and not a passive love. One commentator says that, the, that rather than love is patient, love is kind, a better translation would be love shows patience and love acts with kindness. Love is about doing these things. What would it look like if in an act of showing patience, we don't simply tolerate people who say something we disagree with, but we actively try to understand why it is they believe that way and actively try to create dialogue? And what if, in an act of kindness, we don't simply smile and be cordial to those we don't like, but we go out of our way to build a relationship with those individuals? Now, I understand there are times when people's words or actions are simply too hateful and simply too harm harmful to tolerate. But that is the thing about love. It is hard. Sometimes it means caring and reaching out to someone we have little in common with. But other times it means speaking up when someone's actions or words are hurting themselves or others. New Testament scholar Brian Peterson writes, Love is a busy, active thing that never ceases working. It is always finding ways to express itself for the good of others. Peterson goes on to write, Paul never says that such love feels good, but true love is not measured by how good it makes us feel. In the, context of, in the context of 1 Corinthians, it would be better to say that the measure of love is its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. I want to say that again. The measure of love is its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. In a world that feels like it is becoming more and more divided, I fear that as a society we are forgetting what it means to live with this love for the others around us. You see this more and more as outcomes are measured by who is winning and who is not, and rather than about how a society as a whole benefits. You see it on social media in which more and more political memes are shared in which the goal is to make fun of and dehumanize with those we disagree with. And you see it when something as simple as wearing or not wearing a face mask becomes a political symbol rather than an act to protect community health. It is important for us as a society to study what Paul is saying here, especially those of us who truly desire to live as Christ followers. How can we do the hard work of building up our communities in love rather than self-interested boasting? How can we celebrate the diversity of God's creation through dialogue and understanding rather than isolating ourselves into like-minded homogenous factions. CBS This Morning did a story in 2018 about a group called Better Angels in Lebanon, Ohio. This is a group of people from within the community that are on different ends of the political spectrum. There are people in the group who voted for Donald Trump and consider themselves die-hard red Republicans. And then there are those in the group who are self-described, unashamed, partisan blue Democrats. What is interesting about this group is they collectively understand the need for dialogue and understanding, and they have agreed to come together to discuss tough issues and listen without interruption 
to what the other side has to say. On the day that the show was taped, they were discussing the issue of gun control in America, which we all know is one of the toughest issues for our country right now. What I found helpful about this story is that as you see the groups voicing their own beliefs, the other side was listening and trying to understand, though not feeling like they, like they needed to agree. As the story continued, you were able to say, to see how this group was able to create community and among some of its members, so much so in a way that they hung out socially and built friendships with those who were not of like mind. It is an example of learning how to love in a way that is hard. An example that we need now more than ever. As we continue to live in an era of COVID-19, we need those around us to help us survive and carry on as a society. We cannot make it if we continue to divide ourselves out and go about life in our own groups. We have to consider what it means to live in Christ's love in a way that builds one another up, even when we disagree or we don't understand. And Christ tells us how to do that. When he, when he is asked what the greatest commandment is by religious leaders who are looking to trick him, Jesus gives one of the simplest answers he could, he could give. He says first to love God, but just as important is to love your neighbors as you would love yourself. Think about those times when people disagreed with you or when you, mis, or when you were misunderstood. How do you wish people had, had made room for you to be recognized? A couple of years ago, as my wife and I were out shopping, I noticed out of the corner of my eye there was a little boy of no more than five or six years old who could not take his eyes off me and, more importantly, off of my wheelchair. You could tell he was trying to process why I looked so different from everyone else in the store, and he was going about the task of getting to the bottom of it. He began tugging at his mother's pant leg, and after he had gained her attention, she kneeled down beside him to see what was so important. Truthfully, I've been in this situation on multiple occasions, and I was preparing myself knowing this boy was going to ask about my wheelchair. However, the question that came out of this little boy's mouth was not one that I was expecting. When the mother asked him what he wanted, the boy asked, What is with that old man? The mother, who up until this point hadn't noticed my presence, quickly looked in my direction, and the shade of her face and the shape of her eyelids indicated that embarrassment had taken over. The mother went right to work, shushing the boy, and she said, Shh, honey, he's not old. His questions weren't over, though. Well, why is he in that, in that thing? The mother replied, Honey, He's in a wheelchair now. Be quiet. It dawned on me at this moment that this little boy had seen so many in a wheelchair before. However, he had always associated wheelchairs with elderly people who may have used them in a hospital or in a nursing home. And what had intrigued him was seeing someone much younger, I myself about my mid-20s at that time, using a wheelchair and not being able to work through the difference in his head. I quickly tried to comfort the mother out of her embarrassment, letting her know that it was quite all right, that I was perfectly fine with these questions, and I began trying to explain to this little boy that I had to use a wheelchair because I couldn't walk. My explanation still wasn't sitting right with the boy, and so he asked, well, why can't you walk? I explained that I was in a car wreck when I was a little boy, not much older than himself, and ever since then I hadn't been able to move my legs. The little boy, still wrestling with this in his mind, looked up at me in the face and then down at my legs, and then looking back in my face, he said, Yeah, you can. Get up. The look on his mother's face at this moment showed that this uncomfortable situation was way too much for her to handle, and she quickly grabbed the young boy's hand and retreated to the next aisle to prevent any more questions that he might have. My wife and I chuckled at the situation and continued on with our shopping, but as luck would have it, it wouldn't be my last encounter. As Joe and I were leaving the store, I went to grab the handle of the door, but instead it quickly swung open, and there, standing right in front of me, was that little boy staring me once again in the face. But by the look on, on his face this time, he had taken the cue from his mother, 
that he wasn't supposed to ask any more questions. And without really knowing what else to do, a smile came across this young man's face and he reached up and gave me one of the biggest hugs I've ever received. And then he just continued on as if nothing had happened. I found myself in similar situations throughout my life. As little ones are intrigued by my wheelchair and they're quick to ask questions so they can know more about me while their parents are often left squirming in what they see as one of the most uncomfortable of situations. What I love about this story is that while the mother found herself uncomfortable and looking to flee the situation, the instinct inside of this young boy was to find out as, uh, find out as much about me as he could and when he was no longer supposed to, his heart just told him to give me a hug and offer some love, comfort, and acceptance. Love is hard. Love takes work. And love isn't always just about how we feel, but more importantly, it's about how we are working together and with others to build up the most peaceful and welcoming community that we can. That is the type of community that offers hope. And that is the type of community that builds up the kingdom of God. Amen. We're going to sing from The Faith We Sing, page 2223. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We're returning to Worship in the Sanctuary on Sunday, July 11th at 11 a.m. Yay! We hope to see you there. Masks will be required for now so that our unvaccinated attendees of all ages are safe and not ostracized or labeled. So we appreciate your complying with that. Thank you. The Finance Committee will meet on 621 at 6 p.m. Council meeting will follow at 630. That is tomorrow night. The trustees will meet at 6 on Thursday, July 1st. 
On Tuesday, July 6th at 6.30, the Task Force on Reopening will meet in preparation for our July 11th opening of the Sanctuary for in-person worship. Now go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen.